as we have made it so clear that fasting is to abstain from what breaks the fast with an intention. So I have an intention during the day that I will abstain from whatever breaks the fast. That's, sometimes people may use or perform some of the things that will break the fast. But are there situations where the fast is not broken? And are there situations where the sorry, as opposed to the situations where the fast is broken? And in other words, if I was to drink water, is it possible for me to drink water and my fast not be broken? Yes, there are situations. The first situation where things can happen and my fast isn't broken is if I drink water forgetfully. Not that I forget that water is of the mufattarat. It's not me forgetting that water is of, not of the things that break your fast. It's forgetting that I'm actually fasting. So if I forget that I'm fasting and I do something that breaks the fast, my fast is still good. But the moment that remembrance enters, I must stop. I remember one guy told me he had a whole meal. He was eating and he said when he finished and all the savory taste that was in his mouth, he wanted to drink a nice sweet beverage afterwards to wash it down. He said the moment I got the cold beverage, this was in summer, he said I remembered I was fasting. So that's it, that's where it stopped. So, sahtena albak as I say, you know what you got, you got. That's it, you can't have anything else. So if I forget that I'm fasting, regardless of the quantity, I must stop the moment I remember that I'm fasting. Now, sometimes we have the issue where someone is ignorant to something being a mufattar. Because generally, what do people, when you tell them, what is fasting Shah Ramadan? Ask anybody. All they tell you is abstaining from Eating and drinking. That's all people know. And the smokers say smoking. That's all people know. People don't know the rest of them. So say I am ignorant of something that is a mufattar. Say I did not know that ascribing lies to the Allah and his messenger is a mufattar. And, a mufattar. and I decide to say a false hadith or a false verse. Does my fast become void? Now the answer is yes. Why? Because I know that I'm fasting. Just because I didn't know the rule does not mean my fast becomes sound. But where does it become sound? Where do you become safe? When it comes to the expiation, the kafara. All you have to do is the qada. See, you have two types of people. You have one that's called a qasr and one that's called a muqasr. The difference between them is a qasr is someone that actually investigated. He tried to find the answer. And as far as his investigations and his learnings, this is all he understood. A muqasr is basically someone that couldn't care less. Didn't bother. Someone that didn't bother, but he didn't know, but he didn't investigate. In both cases, if they are ignorant, they have to do the qada, regardless, means they have to repeat the day. But when it comes to the expiation, in both cases you will find the fuqaha for the qasr, the one that actually did make an effort, they'll say there's no kafara. But even the muqasr, the majority of fuqaha say that there is no kafara for them either, but they have to repeat that day. Finally, if I am coerced, you know, sometimes someone forces you to do something. For example, if someone turned around and gave you a cracker or a biscuit and said, eat it. And if you don't eat it, I'll beat you. 
and you don't want to get beaten, so you eat it. Okay? You have to do the qada for that day, but there's no kafar. But there's a difference when it comes to coercion and forcing someone to do something. There's a difference to when I actually do the thing and when someone forces me to do it. Let me explain what I'm trying to say. If I am next to, for example, a cliff edge into the water, someone stands and says, listen, jump in the water or I'm going to beat you once again. The beating. And I become afraid that I may get beaten and I dive into the water and my head has been immersed under the water and my fast has been broken in that sense for the fuqaha that say it gets broken, I still have to repeat the day. But if I'm standing next to the cliff edge and someone pushes me in the water, my fast is still good. Why? Because I didn't do it from my own accord. Do you understand what I mean? There's a difference when someone, and, and this usually, this question comes into the problem between marriage, married couples. In married couples, a lot of the times, a woman, she's a righteous woman, and she's married to some guy, you know, someone that she's scraped from the bottom of the barrel. God knows, bottom of the barrel, where she got him from. And he decides, okay, you know, I want to get my right from her. And we're fasting. And she says, no, I don't want to. And he says, if you don't, I will divorce you. So she allows him to. Now, her fast is broken. She has to do the qada because she allowed him. But if he forces himself upon her, if he violates her, her fast is still sound. And he has to not only pay, see, in this case, not only does he have to do the qada, but he has to pay the ikafara for both of them. So if we're present in an Islamic government, the hakam al shara would punish him for breaking the fast, and he'd also punish him for breaking her fast, in that sense. So pretty much, that's that point when it comes to breaking our fast. Sallallahu alayhi Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Allah Azza wa Jal says, Wa ila madyan akhahum shu'ayba. Qala ya qawmi abudullah ma lakum min ilahin ghayruh. So we came to the people of Madian, Shu'ayb, ala nabiyyina wa alihi wa alihi afdal salatu wa salam, and said, Worship God because these people were idolaters. Just to put you in the timeline, Shu'ayb was after the time of Abraham and around the time of Musa. So if I'm going to put him in a timeline, he would have been somewhere between 2000 towards 1000 BC, around that era. So, you know, generally they try and pinpoint Musa at 1250 BC, but I don't go with the, the strong timelines. I don't go because they try and bring it in that timeline to associate him with Ramses II. We don't know who the pharaoh was. We don't have anything strong suggesting which of the pharaohs it was. But we know it's around that time because we have some history. Well, we don't just fully negate archaeological finds. And, but if they don't have anything for certain, you can't just go with it. So around that time, Shu'aib would have been around. So then he said to the people of Madian, do not worship other than God because of their ways. Then he mentions this point. وَلَا تَنْقُصُوا وَلَا تَنْقُصُوا الْمِكْيَالَ وَالْمِيزَانِ إِنِّي أَرَاكُمْ بِخَيْرٍ You know, sometimes when it comes to... I don't know if you've ever seen any of those olden documentaries or movies where they show you where people rip off people with the scales. Sometimes the weights, they're not actually weights. They're painted silver or they're painted like metal, but they're not metal. They're lighter, so you think that you've got the right weight. So do not, when it comes to give everyone what they've paid for, don't decrease 
in the value of what they've paid for. And then he says, Inni araqum bi khair. And this is the biggest problem. Inni araqum bi khair. It means you're prosperous. And this, you'll find this with a lot of people. The biggest people that commit rorts and rip-offs are people with money. They've got money. They're prosperous. They've got money. They're financially capable. Yet they, because they have money, they want to make that extra dollar. Don King, which is one of the most famous people you could think of, Don King made millions through boxing promotion. Don King committed murder in the 1970s. I don't know if anyone's heard of this. 19, late 60s, I think, or 70s. And he was rich. What murder did Don King do? Don King stomped a man to death for $400. This guy's a millionaire. He stomped him to death. And he spent about three to four years in jail. If you research this, look at He stomped a guy to death over $400. Do you imagine that? Taban, $400 in the 60s is not $400 today. It was a bit of money and it wasn't a small amount of money. But it wasn't something for you to take a life. He took a life because this is the way that they perceive it. That will end you if you come near their money. But Shu'aib is telling them that I see you are prosperous. You don't, you have no excuse to even do this. Although it is wrong, initially you don't have an excuse. And then in the next verse, he says, وَيَا أَوْفُ الْمِكْيَالَ وَالْمِيزَانَ بِالْقِسْتِ when he mentions here that al mikyal wal mizan, when we're talking about the kail, the measuring cup, we said, and the scales, that you should be just when it comes to weighing, be fair. And then he mentions in this verse, wala tabakhasun nas ashia'ahum. In other words, don't. Meaning, they've written it in the translations and commit abuse towards people by depriving them. It's, it's more than that. Okay? Uh, sorry, sorry. It's saying do not deprive the people. It's more than just depriving the people. I'll give you a good example of how people do this. Have you seen when someone brings a product into an area? I don't know if you'll see this commonly. It's people that come into... In big work in trade, will understand this. Someone brings in, for example, um, they bring in apples to sell. And you see the merchants come in, and they have a look at the apples, and they go, Shah Abda, now what's this? What, you're trying to rip off people with these apples? And they, and they make you feel so bad, you feel like throwing out these apples. And he goes, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be fair with you. Rather than... Cause, uh, rather than jarras hal, like you can embarrass yourself when people walk in and see these apples. I'll buy them off you for half what they're worth, save you the embarrassment. And the apples are good quality apples, but he makes you feel so bad with the product that you have, and you just go, all right, you know, because sometimes someone can say something positive to you, and someone and 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 lift your spirits. You know, when you walk in. And someone, when he says, Salamu alaikum, and you walk in, he goes, No worries, how do you feel? You feel good. These people actually like me. I'm turning up, they like me. You know? And if you walk in and someone says, Oh, speak of the devil. You know? Oh, here he comes. You know? It's just that feeling, even in psychology. I was watching a video for a psychologist that my brother sent me a couple of days ago that he says in this video that. Even simple suggestive things. He goes, you got two people, two groups, to do a multiple choice. In the, the questions were the same, but just the answers, you know, the alternatives that had nothing to do with the answers, were things that described old people, and the other tests were things that described young people. He said when they left the room after the test, the ones that read the terms describing youth went to the elevator swiftly and youthfully and healthily. But the ones that were reading all the terms about being old were sluggish towards the lift. You bring people down. So this is the way that they would make them feel that your product is useless. The person would sell this product 
at a loss. And this is how they would sell products as well. Like then when he brings these apples, he'd turn around, come here, come here. Just off the, off the market. These are the freshest apples you will ever eat. He's just bought them off someone that he's told you have the worst apples. And then he wants to sell them in this way. You know, and, and I'm going to be very careful with my words here. Some used car salesmen, not all. Some real estate agents. Some lawyers. The way, and, and, and a lot of fields, but especially these fields, they love to take advantage of people. They have different strategies. If you see a used car salesman, when he wants to sell you the car. One thing my brother told me when you're in Lebanon, for example, and you want to purchase a car, he told me, first, tell the people if someone wants to sell this car, how much would it be worth? Then ask the people if someone wants to buy this car, how much would it be worth? And the price is somewhere in the middle. And it's, it's a pretty fair analysis, and it worked. It actually works like that. Now, these people, when they want to sell the car, they basically say, look, I've got another three buyers coming this afternoon. You know, if you don't take it, it's gone. And then when they want to purchase the car off you, they go, look, you think I'm going to be able to sell this car? And like, likewise, when people are selling land or buying land, and even, you know, if you get busted, you know, when someone gets busted, when the police turn up, the problem is a lot of the people in the community, they're very... A lot of people are... See, a lot of people don't know how to deal with police. Policemen turns up and they go, oh, my God, I'm going to burn in jail. But the people that know how to deal with police know this guy's got no authority. He's got no chance of touching me. You know, a lot of people, they get themselves in trouble. They end up going to the police station and they dob themselves in. Even though you tell people a million times, you never talk to the police. Never. If he says hello, and you know what I'm saying, never talk to the police. And I'm not talking about dealing in general. If an incident takes place... And they'd say, come and give a statement. Don't even say hello. Until they arrest you, you go. When they arrest you, you say, I want a lawyer. That's it. You don't say another word. This is how normal. another person, what does he do? He says everything he has. So then the lawyer walks in and it's his advantage. He says, you stuffed up. You are looking at least 10, 15 years. And then you think, all right, I'm, how much do I pay you? And he says, you know how much a good barrister costs these days? And the whole time you are at their mercy. This is the issue here. At this point, they're supposed to be just when dealing with you. Just in this manner. And Madian was a pit stop. See, Madian was the pit stop, the transit for all merchants. So what happens? Sometimes you stay there for a few nights. Sometimes you're there. What happens when you're traveling? You get hungry. And what happens when we arrive at an airport? Generally, the prices are what? Cheaper? Honestly, <laughs> in Lebanon, in the airport, sorry, the only reason I'm saying Lebanon, because that's, that's where we usually end up. A drink is 10 times the price that it is outside. 10 times. I'm not using hyperbole. Maybe more. I might have underpriced it. So you arrive there in the airport, everything's more expensive. It's like they've got a license to violate people. You know, they're standing there, step right up, one after the other. Let's see how much we can take from you. And after you've been violated and defiled, and then you think, oh my God, this was... I wasn't here by choice. I was forced to be in the airport. They take advantage of them in this way. The same thing happens when you go to Ziara or the Hajj. The prices are astronomical. You turn up honestly, Ziyarat al Hussein alayhi salam, Karbala, and honestly, seven star hotel, no chance. Six, five, four, no chance. It's a hostel, it's not even a hotel. I'm telling you from my experience, you get taken in. You know how you, I swear you feel like, you know, those chickens where they are put in a place to lay eggs. That's it. You just got a cage and they got like six people in this room the size of a shoebox. And you're paying a hundred US per person, not per room, per person per night. Halab Ali. Come in. 
100 US. And then you got the other people standing on the road feeding you for free from their own wealth. And these people that are supposed to be Sukkan Karbala, the people of Karbala, or the people of Medina when you guys yarat Rasulullah, they are the ones that take advantage of you. They rot you, they take every cent from you. Taban, it's seasonal. It's good for you. It's, it's high season. I have high season price and low season. That's acceptable. It's normal. It's business. But not this difference. Not this way, especially when you know people come here for that reason, to take advantage of them at this point. Even some other countries, when you go there, and you want to deal with them in business. I've heard this in Indonesia and in Bali when people go there. I've heard about the colored bag system. If you're a sucker, they give you a colored bag. So every other shop owner knows, you know, not a normal white bag. They give him a colored bag. So this guy, you can rip him. Unbelievable. This is how the system works. Just to make sure that they can make as much money from the people as possible. And this is the way that the people of Madian worked. What you need to know is your income does not come from the sweat of your brow. Does not come from your top. Because I will tell you now, you people that work, don't care how hard you work. Go to see some countries and the labor that they do for the money they earn. Has anyone been to India? Or China and see, you know, all the, cl all the clothes we're wearing here from these two countries. Almost everything we are wearing from them. And they work so hard and they make peanuts. And we get people, we, we, we have an easier lifestyle. And easier jobs compared to what they have in comparison to the money. Your sustenance, your riza is from Allah. It's not from anyone else. And it's not from your intelligence. It's not from how educated you are. You could be the smartest person on the planet. You could be the smartest person on the planet. You just take a look at the billionaires around you. You take a look honestly, Clive Palmer. Clive Palmer doesn't have a three digit IQ, I guarantee that. Clive Palmer was quoted. He's a billionaire, Australian billionaire. When he was getting into parliament, you know what he said? He said, I'm not corruptible because I'm a billionaire. So if I become a politician, no one can bribe me. So are you serious? Have you looked at all the other politicians there in the world? They are billionaires and they all want more. Clive Palmer is like these other people. Gaddafi, they say, was worth $200 billion. That's what they say. Go look it up. This is not, I'm not exaggerating. They say he was worth $200 billion. He's worth more than the owner of Amazon when he was killed. At that time, so much money he had. And Qaddafi was the one that famously quoted what? He said, when you make supplication dua, only do dua in Arabic because Allah doesn't understand any other language. This is how intelligent Qaddafi was. So when you ask, how do they become so rich? Allah is the one that sustains you. So there's no need for you to rip anyone. There's no need for you to deceive. There's no need for you to make that silent dollar. Or for you to put that clause that no one can read so you can make a sly cent here and there. Be honest when it comes to your dealings. The only trade that you should be thinking about is the transaction that is mentioned in the Quran. Allah Azza wa Jal says in the Quran... In the Quran about what this world is. Firstly, let's take a look at the hadith. The hadith says, Adunya suqun rabiha fi fiha qawmun wa khasira akharun. That this world is a marketplace. This whole world is a marketplace. Some win and some lose in this world. But who wins in this world and who loses? Firstly, let's take a look at, because when we work, when we go business, or we do any kind of dealings, we look for a gain, we look for a profit. The profit and the gain from this world is the hereafter, is paradise. This is all you are working for. 
And this is what, whether you go to work, you are working for the hereafter. Because the ones that go to work in order to provide for their families are what? Are like the one that fights in the way of God. True or not true? Isn't that what the hadith says? So the one that works in a righteous way to provide for their family is working for the dunya or the akhirah. He's working for the akhirah. The one that goes to work to rip people off or to make a dollar, you know, give me easy, easy. Doesn't matter how the dollar comes into my pocket. If I get it from this person or that person, as long as I get the, the dollar into my pocket, you know, this person's not working for the hereafter. He's working for, he's working for this world. Now, the problem you need to know about this world and the hereafter is the hereafter is a preserved trade. It's a preserved gain. And in the hereafter, if you gain it, you've gained everything. You've lost nothing. It's the ultimate gain. Because it's eternity. And if you work for this world, and something logical, this world is perishable. Everything in this world or for this world ends. Everything in this world is transient. This money that you make, that you make in excess, all you're doing is saving it for someone else. It's not for you, it's for someone else. Everything you earn is for someone else. Because when you die, all you are is a rotting corpse that everyone buries six foot under. Because Do you know why they bury you so far under the ground? Because they don't want to smell your stench. I'm talking about my stench. Not when I say you, I don't mean you. I'm talking about myself. So that they don't smell our stench, they bury us so far under. And the first thing they worry about is what did I leave behind? So the people of Madian, they dealt with the people unjustly and they made false transactions with them and they weren't fair. Inshallah, tomorrow night is the birth, we celebrate the birth of the second holy imam, al-imam Al Hassan ibn Ali and Al Mushtaba, Salawatullahi wa Salaamu Alaihi. But after that, the following night, I will continue to talk about what happened with the people of Madian. And we will discuss another subject that caused their destruction. A subject that many people fall under. But tomorrow night, inshallah, is the celebration of the birth of the Imam. So we'll leave that until we meet again tomorrow. والحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى اللهم على محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين